Well, here we are back again, myself and Thomas Alexander there in Germany. Uh, we, we knew we couldn't stay away too long because it's been great to see how popular your videos have been. Luxembourg, especially that one, look, it went right to the top. Uh, it has gone faster than almost any other video that I've put up this year. And, and I think the reason why, Thomas, is because so much of what you Germans have been doing there in Germany, you've kept in German. And so we've not really had access to what you guys and gals are doing over there. And now suddenly with you able to really speak English well, you are very good at communicating. Uh, you are able to unpack it and give us not just a tertiary overview of people like Gunther Luling and, uh, and uh, Christoph Luxemburg. You've been able to really delve into and do a deep dive into their material and showing us just how significant their studies and their research is concerning the antecedents to the Quran or where the Quran came from. And you explained it very well. I love that seven step process that you went through uh, that is Luxembourg's seven steps, but you explained it so well, it makes sense and we can all now use it with our Muslim friends. Now, what you're going to do now, you're going to change gears and we're, we're, we're moving now to the whole formation of Islam. Listen, this is the uh, this is the uh, golden spoon. This is the the missing link that everybody has been looking for. Uh, Odin tried to do it. We know that many have asked us to do it. Mel has certainly delved into this area. Paul was working on this area. Others have gone through and they've tried to say what really did happen in the seventh century. Because we, listen, everybody is convinced now that the ninth and tenth century narratives or the, the standard Islamic narrative and the uh, Islamic traditions have completely have it wrong. There's an agenda. They're only interested in their agenda, the Abbas agenda, agenda, which is from Baghdad, hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years later. But what then happened? So what really went gone? How did Islam begin? What are its origins? What was going on there in the 7th and 8th century? And you're going to do that. You've been listening to Odon. Uh, you have emailed me and mentioned once or twice that you agree with an awful lot Odon has come from, uh, come up with from the French school. But you say that there are some things that you in the German school are actually have or can bring to the table that is different than what the French school has brought to the table or even what they found there in Ireland and in England. We don't really have much of a school here in America yet. So we're kind of way behind all of you. But it's great to be able to have you come on board now. Tell us what the Germans are finding concerning how Islam began, the formation of Islam. That's what we're looking at. Since we know it, we can't trust those traditions, how then did it happen? Uh, without any further ado, I leave it to you. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Jay. What I want to show you today is the a, a broad brush, basically looking at the history of the Near East, um, going back actually much further than the origins of Islam, just to paint a picture of what's the, the tapestry on which, on which this religion evolves, more or less. And we all know that there are indeed many issues. Um, for once, we know the story about the four righteous caliphs and how they conquered um, Syria and Palestine and Egypt and Persia. But the thing is, when we look at the historical record, there is no evidence in archaeology. So what we would expect is if there's a big, massive war um, and a new, rule, a new army comes in and takes over, that particularly the smaller settlements on the, on the outskirts that are not well protected, they usually are either destroyed or abandoned. Because if you're coming with a large army of, say, 50,000 or whatever, then all these people need to eat. And there are no big supply lines to Arabia. <laughs> so they take what they can from the land. And that's what we typically see in these large conquests. And we don't see this here. So um, particularly here, Yehuda Nebo, um, famous archeologist, he has looked into this and he said, there's basically a continuum of, of settlements. There is no big disruption. So we know that there's a big problem here. And to understand what's really going on, we have to look um, yeah, well, at the history. In, in a bit more detail. That's what I want to do today. And with that, let me jump in. So um, I don't want to lose much time because we've got a lot to go through today. So let's jump right in. And you can see I'm starting in 250 AD, so really, really early. And what I want to show you here is how 
Um, basically, most of the Near East was Aramaic speaking. So that was the lingua franca, the, the language that everybody, everybody used in, in, in their daily lives, more or less, um, which they had to, had to use the language of bureaucracy and, and all of that. Um, well, next to Greek, actually, at least in the Western part, but we'll get to that here. So what we, what we can see is that while this is sort of one um, population, it's not perfectly homogeneous. They are very similar, but because the Western part is occupied by Rome and the Eastern part by Persia, we can see um, those influences in the West and in the East um, as well. Now, next, in those times, we already see Christianity spreading rather rapidly. Um, so those dark areas are areas where we actually have a lot of Christians, where they form a, a plurality, not necessarily the majority, but they were among the religious groups in those dark areas, they were mostly the largest ones. And in those bright areas, we have evidence of Christian settlements as well. Um, not very much, so very often it's just individual, like um, small settlements, like not many people, small communities, but it's, you can see it's definitely spreading um, by 250 already, even into Persia. Um, and next one, what we also see is politically, um, well, here we see the Roman Empire in the West and the Persian Empire in the East, the Sassanid Empire. Um, I think last time I already mentioned that there were lots of deportations going on. And indeed this, this um, well, it did, didn't start in 250, um, but that's when it really took off because um, Shapur the first, who was king of Persia, he um, had a massive war with the Roman Empire and he deported hundreds of thousands of people, which back in those days, if you think about like how comparatively small the world population was, is, is huge. And lots of those were also Christians. Um, as we can see, those were like the most Christianized areas where he deported people from. Now we'll do a quick jump to 325. That's when the Council of Nicaea took place. So that's, well, not, um, so the Christian, he wasn't yet the, um, the re uh, official religion of the Roman Empire, but he was getting there. And what's important here is that the Arians and anti-Trinitarians are now formally out of communion with the Catholic Church. Um, so what that means is that a lot of Syrian Christians who did not subscribe to um, this Trinitarian view actually moved into Persia as well. And then another jump to 410. This is when there was the Council of uh, Seleucia Tessiphon. So that's sort of the Persian equivalent to the Council of Nicaea in the Roman Empire. So what has happened is um, Christianity also has spread in Persia, and at first it was ignored, then they started to persecute Christians like the Romans did, just with a, a time delay, and eventually they saw that this doesn't work. Um, at the same time, the Persian um, king was afraid that because by 410, um, Christianity was the religion of the Roman Empire, or in, um, yeah. And so he feared sort of mixed loyalties among his populace, right? So if more and more Christians are in his empire and his empire is mostly Zoroastrian and the Romans are the Christians, then he, he was afraid that in case of a war, which there were many wars, um, yeah, there could be mixed loyalties. So he wanted a Persian church as well. And that's what happened in 410. Um, and what you can see on this map, in those dark areas. So that's where the, of it, um, the ecclesiastical um, organizations were. So that's where you had bishops and, and, and so on. So that's where we would see most Christians in, in Persia. Um, part of this council was also that um, at this point, the, the Church of the East was formed as it's known. Well, nowadays it's often also called the Nestorian Church. And they adopted the Council of Nicaea. So they became officially Trinitarian. Right, so. okay. Now, next one, another jump. Now we're in, 400, uh, in 540. And again, we see a major war, this time between the Byzantine Empire, which is the success of the Roman Empire in the East, 
and the Sassanid Empire. And again, here we see massive deportations. So I mean, there were lots of wars in between and lots of deportations in between, but it's really those two, um, the one in around 250 and now the one under Khosrow the first, where most people were deported. Because it was what was really going on in Persia is all those kings, they built new cities and then they were empty and then they needed people. So <laughs> they deported people from uh, often from Syria and moved them to further to the east. And I think in, in 540, almost all of Antioch was to Port East. Um, yeah. Can I just jump in here, go back to yes. that map? It looks like uh, you have the arrows going to the west, but what you're saying is he goes to so the west. So it's basically, yes. Back. The arrow is the, the armies of Khosrow marching, but then he takes the, um, <laughs> basically he takes the, the the, the Christian, um, yeah, the people, the Christians with him, sort of, and moves them into his, his own. So he brings cities. them back. He brings yeah. them back then to, yeah. or he brings them back exactly. uh, over to the east again. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right. Now by six hundred. Now we're again looking at um, the spread of Christianity, and what you can see is, first of all, of course, the Byzantine Empire is now predominantly Christian, but also Western Persia is now more or less Christianized, and even in the East. So now it's it's still a minority in Eastern Persia, but there are places like around um, Shiraz and Merv where it's a very strong minority. So, it's, so there are probably still more Zoroastrians, but, but the Christians are making up a, a large proportion there. And yeah, so basically Persia at this point was on the verge of becoming Christianized. But then and now comes the important basically event that, that sort of sets up everything else. And that's the war, the last war between uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire. And here I need to give a bit of a, uh, yeah, more background information. So the last war at this point, so in 602, this war breaks out. The last war between the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire just ended 11 years before. Um, and since then, things didn't go well for the Byzantine Empire. So they were really on the brink of financial collapse. Um, they couldn't finance the army anymore. Um, and they were under a lot of pressure also in the West, which we'll look at in a second. And then in 602, uh, the Emperor Maurice um, sent his armies to Pannonia. Um, so that's modern day. Romania, um, Hungary, so that 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 area. Um, that's where the Avars were now moving in. So this is like a like um, people from the steppes in in Russia or somewhere. Actually, I think people we don't really know where they came from, but they arrived in Europe and they put a lot of pressure on the Byzantine Empire now in in the West. So he sends his armies there and. He basically tells them stay the winter there and live off the land and the army isn't very happy about this so they mutiny they um make they declare their um, their general emperor move on into constantinople and kill the entire royal family and then the general focus basically takes over so in edessa the governor of Me the byzantine province of mesopotamia he rebels because he was a friend of maurice and then Focus obviously sends his troops and besieges the city. And then Narses, the governor of Mesopotamia, he calls to Kosro the second for help. He's the king in, um, in the Sassan Empire. And he's actually the son-in-law of the previous Emperor Maurice, because part of the last, last peace deal that happened 11 years prior was that um, Kostro II, he married the daughter of Maurice, and they signed an eternal peace uh, deal between the Byzantine Empire and the Sassan Empire. But, well, that eternal peace deal that lasted 11 years, because Kostro saw his chance. He saw that basically the Byzantine Empire right now is, is at a very weak point, and he goes in and, um, well, tries. At first, he, he goes in um, under the umbrella of, yeah, I, I want to avenge Emperor Maurice and get the right heir on the throne, but pretty quickly turns in a, in a, into a war of conquest. Now, 
as I said, the situation was pretty terrible for the Byzantine Empire. You know, a quick look into the West. So I'm, I'm mainly focusing on the East, but now we have to do a quick detour in the West. And what we can see here is that the Byzantine Empire is on the defense across the board. Only 50 years prior, they were basically reconquering or reestablishing the Roman Empire of old. So they had just reconquered Italy from the Ostrogoths. They had reconquered Northern Africa from the Vandals. And they were in the process of reconquering Spain from the Visigoths. But then there came several wars with the Sassanids, actually. And that, what that means is that basically all, all the troops had to go to the east, and then the west was open for the barbarians. So by 602, they're basically lo they've lost um, the Iberian Peninsula, basically. Not quite yet, but they will in a, soon. And they lost Italy again now to the Longobards who are moving in. And this brown uh, speck here, those are the Avars who are now pushing from, from the north. So basically, the, now the Byzantine Empire basically has a war on two fronts on their hands. And indeed, it, the war goes terrible for them. So I'm going to do a quick jump to 621. And as you can see, it doesn't look very good for the for the Byzantines. So the basically Persians win every every single battle they're in. Um, there isn't much of an army left in the Byzantine Empire, and Phocas turns out to be a terrible ruler. He's like a tyrant. Um, there's a lot of unrest throughout his empire. And in 608, another civil war breaks out, which is you would think is a pretty bad idea. You have a war on two fronts, and now your army starts killing each other. Um, but it might have saved uh, the Byzantine Empire, actually, because um, at the end of the civil war, Phocas is out and Heraclius comes in. And he immediately starts turning things around, but it's a slow process. So the first problem is, is of course, the finances and the expensive army. And what he does is he completely restructures the, the Byzantine um, well, the Byzantine state, the way it's administered. Um, he puts everything under direct military control and he gives his soldiers a uh, piece of land, of abandoned land, which was there was plenty of in Asia Minor. So he didn't have to pay them, basically. Um, and going forward, this was... But what this year was are we now? Are we, this is 621? 620, um, so we're between 602 and 621, basically. So this happened during the war. So after Heraclius took over, that was 610. Um, he basically, he, he completely changed the administra administration. But this is a long-term process, right? So he still had, like, not much to work with at this point. And the Sassanids, they just took like one battle after battle after battle. So in 613, they conquer Syria. In 614, Khosrow II takes Jerusalem. He destroys the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and he steals the True Cross, which was a major blow for Christianity at that time. Um, and in 615, the Persians reach um, Chalcedon. So that's right across the Bosporus Strait from from Constantinople, from the capital. So they could back, they could see the capital, the Persian army. Um, it's still, I think it's half a mile across. So they, they couldn't actually get across because the Byzantines still had the best navy, um, but they were right there. Um, and at this point, um, it is actually, um, or, or we are told that Heraclius tried to capitulate and he was supposedly willing to turn the Byzantine Empire into a client kingdom of the Sassanids. Um, so we, now some historians think that's probably not what he wanted anyway. So maybe he wanted to stall for time, maybe start some negotiations that would go nowhere. We don't know, but it seems like he actually offered this to Khosrow II, but Khosrow refused. So he thinks everything is going so well for me, I'll just take, it, take the Byzantine Empire outright. I don't want a client kingdom here. Um, in 618, Heraclius actually plans to abandon Constantinople and thereby abandon basically the East completely to the Sassanids and he wants to move the capital to Carthage. Um, again, we're not sure if he really wanted this or if this was like a clever, um, clever scheme uh, to, um, it, to deal with interior politics. 
the outcome is that there are massive protests and in, in especially the church doesn't want um, Constantinople to be abandoned because Constantinople was sort of the center of Christianity, of the Greek Christianity at that time. So they come to a, an agreement and the church agrees to pay for the war effort from now on. So he stays, he stays in Constantinople. Now money is no longer an issue for him. And also the, um, his reforms start to take, um, yeah, take effect. However, still in 619, Kosro conquers Alexandria and by 621, he has control over all of Egypt. And so that's sort of the map we see here. But then something surprising happened. Um, and that's in 622, the very next year, Heraclius has a major military victory. Actually the first one in this entire war for the Byzantines. And what he does, so he now has his new army, his reforms start to work, he built up a new army, he has the money from the church. His army is still nowhere near as large as the Sassanid one, but they are spread out. They are occupying all those um, regions like Egypt, Palestine, Syria, and so on. So their main force is now roughly equal in size as Heraclius' new army. And what he does is he moves out of Constantinople um, right around Easter, right after Easter, actually, after Easter celebrations, at, at the helm of his army. So it's also something that didn't happen anymore, actually, that an emperor would go out leading an army. It was a thing of the past, but he, he did it. And he didn't actually confront the Persian army that was in Asia Minor. He just walked straight past them towards Persia, actually through towards Armenia, because Armenia sort of was the gate to Persia. Um, the Persians, the Persian army eventually realizes it and they scramble to, to follow him. And then in Armenia, there's this major battle, um, which is really interesting, but I can't go into this in detail because it does, doesn't really matter for our story here. End result is anyway, Heraclius totally obliterates um, the main Persian army. And so the, for the first time, the Byzantines have a, have a big victory. So this happened in 622, and that's really an important date because what happens next is that Khosrow withdraws his Persian troops from the occupied lands because you know he needs to build up a new army. So he, he recruits new people in Persia, but he also withdraws the Persian troops from Syria and, and so on. However, when he conquered those regions, he also used Arab auxiliaries. So these are um, sort of troops that are not integrated into the main army, but fight side by side. That's something that both sides did. So the Romans, you had auxiliaries from all over the place, or the Byzantines in their case. They both used Arab auxiliaries, um, but the, the Arab auxiliaries, they came to the Persians, they basically, they stayed. So they said, well, we have a nice, nice gig going here, right? They took over some land, they, they just stayed back. Um, at the I same time- here. Are these yeah. the Ghassanids and are these the Lakhmids? So the Ghassanids were already in, were already there. So they were auxiliaries of the Byzantines. The Ghassanids have been sort of a client kingdom for centuries for, for the Byzantines. The Lakhmids, they come from Persia. Yeah. So they were, they came into this area via like through this war. And then they stayed, stayed there. Um, and I think they mainly stayed in Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. So they they came into Egypt and then stayed there. Yeah, um, exactly. And the Byzantines, however, they were in no shape to occupy those lands again. Right? So they had just had their army, it was successful, but if they would spread it out again, it would be easy pickings for the Persians to reconquer it. So what they did instead is the old tried and test method of introducing client states. And that's what we're going to look at in the next map, sort of. Um, so that's something that the Romans and the Byzantines have long done. So the Ghassanids, for instance, they used to be a client kingdom. It was dissolved shortly before this war, but for centuries they were a client of uh, the Byzantines. Um, you have Armenia, which used to be a client kingdom. And what that means is, as a client, you basically recognize the superiority of the emperor. If the emperor calls for um, arms, you have to supply some troops. 
and then you have to be open for trade. But other than that, you are completely autonomous. Um, and that's basically what happens now everywhere in the, in the former Byzantine um, areas here. So Palestine, Syria, Egypt, those all become small client kingdoms ruled by Arab um, tribes because they are now the, the biggest military force in those regions. Um, thereby, the Byzantines, they still get access to the, all the trade. They, still, they can call, uh, call up troops from there, but they don't have to defend those lands because this, this is now something that the Arabs would do. So they can keep their army in one, like in, in, in one powerful group. Um, so the war at this point still isn't over, 622, but um, there's some back and forth. Now, obviously, the, the Persians, they try their counteroffensive and they actually align themselves, themselves with the Avars and attack Constantinople from both sides. Um, but in the end, they are beaten, completely destroyed, um, their armies. And Heraclius marches onto Tessiphon, Khosrow is deposed, and then his successor immediately uh, sues for peace. And yeah, well, Heraclius is only too, ha only too happy to agree to it because he knows that even though he's just had an impressive military victory, the Byzantine Empire is not in good shape. So yeah, he wants peace as quickly as he can. And what they agree on basically is on the borders as they were before the war. However, um, as we just said, the, the Byzantines, they didn't reoccupy those, those regions. Instead, they created client kingdoms. All right, now we'll do another jump to 641. And that's the year Heraclius dies. And what we see is that the Arab client kings or um, client rulers start to mint their own coins. And that's a sure sign that they don't respect the central authority anymore, right? Because minting coins is a royal prerogative. That's the sign that you are the ruler of these lands. Um, so we know that at this point, they sort of break away from the Byzantine Empire. So it um, seems like they have they feel like they have a personal relationship with the Emperor Heraclius. And once he's dead, um, and particularly once his family is out of the, um, or his, his dynasty doesn't exist anymore, um, they seem to break completely with the Byzantine Empire and just do, do their own thing, more or less. But um, they are still not united. Um, they're still individual tribes ruling over, over those lands. And in 651, the Persian Empire also falls. And what precedes this fall is, first, we have a civil war right after the war with the Byzantines, um, which lasts, I think, four years. And in those four years, we have 10 or 12 different kings. So it's a um, crazy time. And then typically, that's when um, the standard Islamic narrative tells us that the Muslim conquest starts. But again, what we see on the ground is there's no evidence of a Muslim conquest. Instead, what we see is that the civil war, it doesn't really end, it just changes form. So before, so before the, the, the civil war was a war about the crown. So different factions wanted different, had different kings that they wanted to get on the throne. By 634, I think 634, yeah, that's over. We have a king and he's undisputed. But what happens then is then again, we see local Persian rulers start minting their own coins, which tells us that the central authority is breaking down. And we see alliances forming and, and like bet between those local Persian rulers. Because um, one thing we need to know is Persia had basically two large well, it's a multi-ethnic state, but they were the two largest ethnic groups are the Parthians, who basically were the rulers before the Sassanids, and the Sassanids are Persians, right? So we have the Parthians and the Persians, and they holding together is what made the Sassanid Empire so successful, and they seem to break up during this time, so they seem to now fight each other. Um, exactly, and 
Then this la the last Persian king apparently also wasn't too good at forming alliances. He was instead very good at alienating friends. Um, so what we see is we see this civil war going on, but now it's local rulers against local rulers against the king, basically. So everybody against everybody. You know, since we already since we come out of this war with the Byzantine Empire, where the Persian army was completely destroyed, and then we had this civil war for the crown. There um, you know, the, the military capacity is pretty depleted, particularly if you are a local ruler. You don't have much, much you don't have much of an army to, to call upon. So what they did is they hired mercenaries. And those mercenaries are again mostly Arab tribes because they lived all over the place, also in Persia already. So what would happen is they would they would pay those those um, Arab tribes to, to provide an army. And at the end, it was mostly a, Arabs fighting, the Persians weren't even in there. So it's a similar situation to what we know happened in Western Rome, in the Western Roman Empire, right? Where Germanic soldiers eventually made up the bulk of the army and then they just took over at some point. Um, and that's exactly what was here. Like at some point, the, the Arabs just looked around to the to these local Persian rulers and said, well, what do I need you for, <laughs> right? Um, I've, got, I've got the army behind me. Um, so we don't really see a conquest, we just see the state falling apart and the strongest military factions that were left are the Arabs, who then again form um, emirates sort of. So we have now lots and lots of Arab emirates throughout the Middle East, but no caliphate yet. But that changes then with Muawiyah. So he is the first um, historically attested um, caliph, although caliph is a bit of a misnomer, that's not a term he would have used. Um, in fact, that's not a term that would be widely used until the ninth century. Up, we know that Abdul Malik called himself caliph, but he probably meant something different than what we understand caliph to, be, to mean today. It had more of a, a religious connotation, um, but it, we'll, we may go into this later. Um, anyway, so Muawiyah is elected Amir al muminin so that's the commander of the faithful, and he takes up residence in Damascus. And what's also um, important to note is Muawiyah is an Aramaic name, not an Arab name, which doesn't mean that he wasn't Arab, um, <laughs> but he probably was uh, from that er area to begin with, right? So probably came from this Aramaic background. He still was, was what, what back then people call an Ishmaelite. Um, now, what, what is typical for Arab rulers is that they gain legitimacy by protecting a sanctuary, or what they call a, what they would call a haram. And because Muawiyah is a Christian, he chooses a Christian sanctuary to protect in Damascus, and that's the head of John the Baptist, which was the most important pilgrimage site for Christians at that time. And indeed, we have, you know, I'm going to show you a coin. So we don't know who this is on this coin. It might be Muawiyah, it might be one of his successors who ruled in Damascus. But what we see, see is, um, uh, we see well, the ruler. On one hand, he has the spear, so he's sort of protecting something. And the other hand, on the other hand rests on a head in some kind of vessel. So that's the head of John the Baptist, which is also indicated by, you can't really tell on this picture, but it's supposed to be a dove that's descending upon him. So that's like a reference to the biblical story, right? Of the dove coming down, uh, Jesus baptism. On the left, we see the cross on, on this uh, globe. And then we have this palm, palm leaf, which is another Chris, Christian symbol. So it's clearly a Christian coin. It's from, from this period. Again, we don't really know if it's Muawiyah or one of his successors. And it indicates that the ruler here is protector of the sanctuary um, of John the Baptist. Now, what we also find under Muawiyah is the first inscription that tells us um, about the Arab calendar, right? So the um, the Arab yeah, dating system, if you will. And it has comes with, the inscription comes with three dates, so we can precisely um, 
narrowed down, we can see how the Arab calendar starts in 622. Now, we've just seen what happened in 622. 622 is the year where the Arabs become independent. And that's why in this inscription, it's also called um, the year according to the Arabs. It doesn't mention a hijra. It doesn't like, does mention um, Moh uh, Muhammad fleeing from Mecca to Medina. It's the year of the Arabs because in 622, they gained their independence. Um, so but then what I did is I tried to look at some other important dates in Muhammad's life and see if I could match it to anything that we've just uh, seen, like to any important events. Now, I will admit, most likely everything I'm telling you is coincidence, except for 622, where I think that's solid, that we are absolutely sure that this is why the Arabs start counting in 622. It's not the Hitra, it's uh, the, the independence. But the other ones, that's just me looking for similarities. So I might just see patterns here where none exist, but maybe there's more to it. I just wanna, wanna throw, throw this out. So Muhammad is typically said to have been born between 570 and 573. Um, in 570, the Turks pillaged the Sassanid borderlands. So that's, um, that would be like Northeast. So that's exactly that area of Merv, right? Um, which is what we talked about last time, where people are from Inara believe the Quran to originate. So this could be like an, an event that sort of might have had some meaning to them. Um, in 573, that's the year when Khosrow the first deported 275,000 people from um, Syria. So that again might be sort of like a birth for Christianity in the, in the new place, which could be um, mythologically charged and used in, in Muhammad's life. And also uh, note that Khosrow I is called Pharaoh in, in the Quran, right? So he's the one um, they compare to the Pharaoh and then the people who write the Quran, they compare themselves to the Jews in exile. Um, in 579, um, the Muhammad receives the first prophecy. That's when the the, the Nestorian monk sees him and, and see, sees in him the prophet. Um, and that's also the year where Khosrow the first dies. So that could be significant. In 610, Muhammad's first revelation, that's also the year when the city of Edessa fell to the Sassanids. And what we need to know here is that this was not supposed to happen, basically. The Christians believed, for them, the city of Edessa was like one of the, the was one of the main Christian cities, and they believed that Jesus himself would come down and defend the city if, if, need, if need be. Um, he didn't, and the city fell, so that, could, again, could be sort of a, a revelatory moment. Um, 619, that's in the tradition, like, the, those are the darkest times, right? That's when there's this Meccan boycott um, on, on the followers and the companions of, of Muhammad when everything looks dark. And it's also the darkest times in the war again, uh, between the Sassanids and the Byzantines. It looks like Christianity is done and the Zoroastrians take over. Right? It's when they conquer um, Jerusalem, destroy the Church of the Sepulchre and move into Alexandria. Then 622, we already saw that, beginning of the calendar. Um, 6 28, in the traditional story, Muhammad captures Mecca. That's the end of the Byzantine Sassanid War. And 632, Muhammad dies. That's the end of the Sassanid Civil War and basically the beginning of the Arab takeover. So I'm just, uh, I'm not saying that there is necessarily a connection except for 622 where I'm basically 99% sure there is, but I think it's interesting that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that there are so many coincidences, if you will. Mm -hmm. um,